Hello and welcome to Rao's IAS. This is the daily news simplified for the date 28th February 2024. And for today's discussion, we will be discussing these seven topics. Now, the first topic for today's discussion is a mains article. And which is inspired by this article, Science Needs Sustainable Funding, which appeared on the science, uh, which appeared on the Hindu. And now today we know that uh, February 28th is celebrated as National Science Day. Right, in the honor of uh, Sir C. V. Raman for his discovery of Raman effect. So, as we all know that science is important for national development and for it, for improving uh, research and development ecosystem in the country, it requires sustainable funding, right? So, this is the major theme of this article. The second main article is regarding electric vehicles and in particular in relation to the FAME phase 2 scheme and what are the efforts and challenges? What are the efforts which the government has made for uh, for inducing electric mobility? And what are the challenges which India faces in this regard? And these three articles we will be summarizing. The first of which is about Raman effect, for which Dr. C. V. Raman fetched Nobel Prize in the year 1930. The second article is regarding astronauts designated for Gaganyaan mission. He Four IAF pilots have been designated as potential astronauts for Gaganyaan mission. We will be seeing about this news. The third article is regarding Human Genome Project, which has been completed recently. And now there will be two MCQs for prelims discussion. And first of which is regarding green credit. And we will see this scheme. And the second is about obelisk, which are a new criteria of pathogens, which have been recently found in the gut. Okay, and now before starting our session, if you like our discussion, give us a thumbs up. And if you have any further questions to ask, you can ask them in the comment section, right? And this is an information regarding the online admission uh, dates for our GS Foundation course. So you can check out this information. <laughs> now let's start our first article for today's discussion. Now this article says this article appeared. On the page number 12 of the Hindu and this article says that why science needs sustainable funding now first of all why does science need funding we all know that development of technology development of basically science foundational science and then technology based on it is very important for a national development and if we see the efforts which Indian government has done in this regard it can be gauged by the presence of four science and technology policies in the country first of which was launched by government in the year 1958 another the second science uh, science policy in the year 1983 then one in 2003 and this was in in the year 2013 the fourth science and technology stip science technology innovation policy was launched by the government though there was a fifth attempt to bring a bring the latest science and technology policy but this is in the draft stage right now if we compare that how india has evolved right from the year 1958 till if we see the science technology innovation policy of two, of 2013 we can see that our goal which was to promote scientific temper or to promote the environment or to uh, foster the science of scientific temperament in the citizen this has been evolved now this has been evolved in later stages to become a self-reliant and to become a country with technical competence and now with the present science and technology policy in 2013 we see that a new word innovation was added in in this policy and from this government aims to link the advancement of science and technology to uh, key priority areas in the country for example the advancement of science and technology with agricultural sector how the sector can be benefited and how the key key priority sectors of country like say agriculture other segments say water say environment say manufacturing sector right the industrial sector in particular how and say health sector how these centers how these sectors 
आर गोइंग टू बी इम्पैक्टेड बाई पॉजिटिवली इम्पैक्टेड बाई डेवलपमेंट ऑफ इनोवेशन राइट एंड नाउ वी कैन सी दैट इन दिस रिसेंट ईयर्स गवर्नमेंट हैज डन अलॉट एंड विच कैन बी रिफ्लेक्टेड इन बाई इंडियाज रैंकिंग इन ग्लोबल इनोवेशन इंडेक्स सो ग्लोबल इनोवेशन इंडेक्स इज लॉन्च बाई डब्ल्यू आई पी ओ वर्ल्ड इंटेलेक्चुअल प्रॉपर्टी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड इफ वी सी द ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री रैंकिंग इन द वर्ल्ड इनोवेशन इंडेक्स रैंकिंग ग्लोबल इनोवेशन इंडेक्स रैंकिंग इंडिया इज रैंक फोर्टी आउट ऑफ वन हंड्रेड थर्टी टू कंट्रीज एंड इफ वी कंपेयर इंडियाज रैंक इन द ईयर ट्वेंटी फिफ्टीन इंडिया स्टोड एट एटी फर्स्ट पोजिशन राइट सो वी सी अ सिग्निफिकेंट इम्प्रूवमेंट इन इंडियाज रैंक एंड नाउ वी कैन ऑल्सो गॉच इंडियाज प्रोग्रेस बाई द एडवांसमेंट इन पर्टिकुलरली इन द हेल्थ सेक्टर एंड ऑल्सो इन अदर बेसिक साइंसेज राइट एंड इंजीनियरिंग बेसिक साइंसेज आई टी सेक्टर अमंग अदर्स बट हैविंग सेट दिस वी सी दैट द साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी द बेसिक साइंसेज और द साइंस सेक्टर इज मैड बाई द डेवलपमेंट और द प्रमोशन ऑफ research and development ecosystem in the country faces certain challenges so we will be going to see certain challenges which the r&d sector faces in india the first and foremost issue is regarding funds which the article talked about so if we see the gross expenditure in research and development in the country it is very poor and the latest india's r&d expense is around 0.64% of india's gdp and which is quite low as compared to india's competitors if we see such expenditure of us it is around 3% of us gdp for china it is 2% and these are the data for other countries so we can see that india just spends 0.64% of its gdp on research and development and this chart if you see this chart which was given in the article this line highlighted here this shows that the gdp of the country is increasing but on the same rate the expenditure especially if we track from the year 2008 2009 the gross domestic expenditure on research and development as a percent of india's gdp is declining right so this is the first issue regarding the low ge rd gross expenditure on research and development the second issue is regarding dependency on public money so we know that presently the research and development ecosystem in the country is primarily based on is primarily funded by public sources or by central government so there is a data to back it so in the financial year 2020 2021 we see that the central government contribution in the r&d expenditure was 43.7% and which was seconded by the private sector investment which is around which is around 36% so and if we see there is a epsimal or lesser contribution by state governments higher education institutions and public sector companies right but if we compare the trend with the trend in developed countries we see that majorly the r&d expenditure there is done by private institutions right but what is the issue that india is not getting enough funding from private institutions so there are certain reasons for it the first uh, which involve that there are regulatory obstacles in the country and some of the reasons are other reasons are inadequate evaluation mechanism of the projects which are being funded especially if the projects are funded in ppp module public private partnership module in that funds there are uh, various coordination issues there are various bureaucratic hurdles or red tapeism issues and because of which private sector is deterred right also in case there are uh, there are other issues with intellectual property right protection so we know that ipr ecosystem in the country is improving we all know that but still there are certain issues in the process in which ipr intellectual property rights are filed right that process is cumbersome and if there are certain issues in that process uh, the scope of resolution the process is very lengthy right also in any case 
there is a in any case there is a conflict and a private investor wants to exit so at that time there is a lack of clear exit options for them and especially it happens in the case of biotechnology or in pharma sector right so these are certain obstacles which particularly hamper the participation of private uh, investors right the they are funding in their private r and d funding right and further even if we have sufficient fund there is a trend where is where those funds are underutilized and this can be backed by this data which says that department of biotechnology in the last year used only 72% of its estimated budget allocation and there is other data that department of science and technology used only 61% of its allocated budget and now we all know that this is because lack uh, because there is a lack of clear deadline when the project is going to be completed there are other issues regarding non seriousness and other issues right the final issue is there is a delay in funding the ministry of science and technology sometimes we have seen that uh, it seeks funds from ministry of finance but there is a lack of idle approach by uh, this ministry by the ministry of finance in allocating uh, budget for this ministry and uh, we have we have already discussed that there is a poor uh, gross expenditure in research and development right so these are some challenges which india faces in this regard so what are government initiatives which government has taken in recent years which will support this r and d ecosystem the first is creation of anusandhan national research foundation and uh, anusandhan national research foundation is a premier institution that would be guiding the road map for research in the country so this would be the premium institution that will guide the road map of how research will be conducted for uh, it would guide the country regarding short term long term and medium plans for conducting research in the country research and development it will be the premier institution for sourcing funding for these uh, research and development programs for international collaboration so this institution was created in the year 2023 last year and it replaced serb which was science and engineering regulatory board right so this is a step which government has taken in order to streamline uh, streamline the way or in order to streamline um, the road map for implementation of science and technology product projects and for their better implementation right other issue other initiative is initiative or what we can say the research in the country or research road map is guided by stip 2013 which we already saw also so this is uh, the science policy the fourth science policy and which guides the road map for research in the country and this policy also suggested that we should increase our expenditure in r and d by 2% right though this has not been implemented yet also in this interim year in this present interim year uh, sorry in this present interim budget government has floated out government has announced creation of rupees 1 lakh crore fund and this fund will provide long term low cost and zero interest road zero interest loans for research and development so this is a fund which was announced in the interim budget this year and also we can see that by the creation of atal tinkering labs so these are small labs which are created in uh, which are created in schools and which which and uh, through these labs uh, the purpose is to uh, purpose is to encourage little minds or encourage the curiosity of children right to further promote the culture of innovation also there is a biotechnology ignition grant and this this uh, this gives financial and mentoring support to young startups and entrepreneurs and further there was an amendment in the patent rules 2021 which uh, laid a procedure for effective or for speedy resolution of complaints in the ipr domain for its speedy resolution right so these are some of the steps which government has taken recently and as the article says that why science needs sustainable funding 
the answer is that india aims to be a developed country by the year 2020 47 right and as we all as we have seen that science and technology will play a major role to achieve this goal and for it we need a sustainable funding and better utilization of funds right and better regulation by the institutional bodies so this is what the article says now let's move to our second main article which is inspired by this news article which appeared on the business line and particularly this news article says that fame to scheme is going to expire on march 31 so fame to uh, stands for faster adopt adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles right so this is scheme this is a scheme by the central government and it is going to expire on march 31 2024 and apart from this this article talks about what are the challenges in the electric uh, electric vehicles in the mobility of electric vehicles what are the challenges in this sector right first of all we need to understand that why do we need to promote electric mobility why do we need electric vehicles first and foremost reason is the climate goals which india intends to achieve we all know that india's intended nationally determined goals it says that indcs contribution goals and india uh, wants to achieve 45% reduction in its greenhouse gaseous emissions by the year 2020 2030 from the 2005 levels so india uh, in order to fulfill this aim and also india wants to become net carbon neutral by the year 2070 so these are certain goals which india needs to achieve right so the first and foremost objective is this and electric vehicles will contribute a lot in order to achieve this goal the second thing is pollution control we all know that the tier 1 or especially and tier 2 cities also the major cities in the country are polluted if you remember a data by who which was released a few years ago it showed that 14 out of 20 cities of the world 14 out of 20 most polluted cities of the world they lie in india so this is a state of pollution in india and in order to minimize this pollution and basically it is through use of fossil fuels right and vehicular exhaust so it, india wants to uh, reduce this vehicular uh, vehicular exhaust by adoption of electric vehicles right other thing is in order to provide energy security we know that we import more than 50% of our fossil fuels from other countries and because of which there is a significant loss of forex reserves for the country so if we switch or if we substitute some of uh, some of our vehicles as electric vehicles this will significantly help india to achieve energy security and it will save india's precious forex reserves right so this is the need to promote electric mobility and for this a foremost scheme which has been lost, launched by government is fame scheme this scheme was launched by the ministry of heavy industry the phase 1 was launched in the year 2015 and it was completed in the year 2019 and then in the then the phase 2 of this scheme was launched in year 2019 for the period of 3 years but in year 2022 it was extended again for the period of 2 years and now cumulatively this scheme existed for 5 years and this scheme is going to expire or end on march 31 2024 right so let's see that what is this fame scheme all about it has three major components first of all it is a subsidy scheme which aims to give demand incentives or which aims to give incentives to the manufacturers of evs and these subsidies will be tied to the battery size that is more the battery size or uh, the battery power more is the subsidy and the aim is that by giving these subsidies to the auto uh, to the ev manufacturers cheaper evs 
will be available to the consumer right or to reduce the price of electric vehicles to the end consumers this is the first and foremost objective and this uh, this scheme this subsidy basically under this scheme is given to the public and commercial transport in the segment of electric three wheelers electric four wheelers and electric buses for this segment for public and commercial transport the subsidy is given to the manufacturer right and see for privately owned vehicles the subsidy is only given for two wheelers that is if you are a private consumer like us people like us if we want to take a four wheeler ev so this subsidy is not given on that particular segment right it is only given for public and commercial transport in the sec in in these sections and for private owners it is only given for the purchase of two wheelers right now another component is that this subsidy would be given only if 50% if the vehicle is fit with 50% of locally made parts by vehicle value right this is in order to promote indigenization of technology also apart from this this scheme aimed to establish a network of charging stations because these batteries these charging infrastructure is important for charging these batteries so these charging stations around 2500 charging stations were uh, to be created in this following 5 years such that in a grid of 3 km by 3 km area there is at least one charging station right also apart from this it aimed to increase awareness regarding the adoption of evs electric vehicles so this is all about fame scheme which was a subsidy scheme given for the manufacturing of electric vehicles so is that there is a faster adoption of evs and the consumers get ev at cheaper rate right but still we see that there are certain issue in this battery evs ecosystem right and what are these issues and which is impacting their adop uh, adoption and adoption of ev is not increasing at the rate in which it was expected to increase right so what are the reasons for it now first of all first reason is high initial cost and india today also the price of an electric vehicle is way higher is higher as compared to conventional fuel vehicles right we if we talk about energy cost in terms of energy evs are way cheaper as compared to conventional fuel vehicles but the initial buying cost is too high this deters the consumers to buy evs right the second thing is range anxiety so there is a kind of anxiety in the mind of uh, people who are driving ev that the battery would uh, battery would be discharged after certain uh, kilometers and if there is not a charging infrastructure how are we going to charge it right so there is a range anxiety because of which this also deterred the adoption of evs right third thing is the issues regarding financing still if we see uh, there are sufficient car loans if you want to buy a a conventional fuel vehicle but the presence of car loans or presence of auto loans or uh, other kind of loans in the segment of ev are still scarce and the primary reason is that because the investors are uh, wary of its they they fear that the resale value of these evs would be not that much right so because of its poor resale value and because of some other issues also because of trust in these evs there is a poor financing infrastructure to give loans and fourthly there is an issue regarding electricity source now all we all know that evs the batteries in evs are uh, uh, will have to be charged using charging stations right but how is this electricity which is used to charge these batteries coming from primarily we we'll, we all know that this electricity is coming from thermal power stations or other kind of conventional energy right and this energy is by its very purpose this is polluting so in one hand you are saying that we want to adopt evs in order to reduce pollution but on the same hand you are charging those batteries by using an electricity which has been produced using thermal power plants so in one sense it defeats the purpose if the batteries are not going to be charged with 
a non polluting source right so what is the way forward the way forward is that we use we need to use green energy sources what are the green energy sources for example solar energy for example wind energy or other green energy sources should be used in order to provide electricity for charging the batteries of evs right but as we all know that primarily 65% of energy production in country is in the route of by via thermal energy right so as of now this is not possible right so this is the major issue with the ev ecosystem as a whole another issue is regarding the battery manufacturing we all know that battery the components of battery uh, for the production of the components of battery we required certain critical uh, minerals these critical minerals for example lithium cobalt and other critical minerals but as we all know that india is we can say around 100% dependent on import of these minerals from other countries and primarily we are dependent on countries like china chile argentina and some other countries so this is an issue that we don't have sufficient raw materials to produce batteries right and now other issue is regarding the poor repair infrastructure in case of electric vehicles and uh, which required skilled labor as compared to repair infrastructure in conventional vehicles right so we have especially the lack of skilled workers also and absence of repair infrastructure other issue is regarding battery disposal we all know that ev is a e waste right so if the if more number of evs are on the ground then it will also require uh, more battery infrastructure for battery disposal but presently the infrastructure for battery disposal is not sufficient so what can be a way forward here the way forward is that india needs to float out a comprehensive national policy on electric vehicle in order to guideline uh, in order to guide the road map for the adoption of ev for consumers as well as for manufacturers also other thing is extension of fame to scheme as we all see uh, saw that the scheme is going to end on uh, march 2024 but still as we all know that the adoption of the goals of this adoption have not been properly met so so government should give a second thought on extension of this scheme such that the other uh, such that this scheme the aim of this scheme is met right and also one other thing if in fame scheme you noticed that this subsidy is not given to privately owned four wheelers ev so government should uh, think of expanding this subsidy to privately owned four wheeler evs also right also other thing other way forward is to build educate charging infrastructures to remove range anxiety for this exploration of critical minerals so so uh, there is a khanij india videsh limited so uh, these are the agencies of government which are uh, over uh, which are looking for which are looking for um, which are looking for critical mineral resources overseas right so these psus or these psus should be encouraged for exploration of these minerals overseas in order that and they should acquire these mines right in order that india is somehow self sufficient in uh, in self uh, self sufficient in uh, in having these critical minerals right and is self sufficient fifthly india should invest more in uh, research and development to manufacture cheap batteries as we all know that batteries are the most uh, batteries are the most expensive component of an ev so also apart from evs india should explore other technology like we should see we should explore hydrogen fuel cells hydrogen vehicles among others these are the technologies which should be explored in order to complement these technologies with electric vehicles further there should be some innovative incentives which can be given to evs for example the road tax on evs can be exempted there can be dedicated parking spaces for evs which can be free of cost among other these can be some incentives which can be given to evs such that people start their uh, people start adoption of evs at a larger scale right now with this let's move on to our next article which is regarding raman effect and we all know that raman effect uh, was discovered by dr c v raman in the year 1928 and he is a revered scientist of india who was given nobel prize in 1930 for this 
discovery right now let's understand what is raman effect now in order to see this let's first see these two images now the first image is the image of sun as viewed from the surface of moon this is the surface of moon and this is how the sky see uh, sky is visible from the surface of moon and if we see that uh, this is how this is a visual from how the sun is visible from earth the surface of earth right now what is the difference between these two images the difference is that there is a absence of color in the first image and there is a prevalence of blue color in the second image now what is the reason for it the reason for it is scattering of light and scattering of light due to presence of atmosphere on earth right so this article is somewhat related to scattering of light now if we uh, check our fundamentals we have seen that we all know that white light white light is made up of seven colors and this is when a white light is passed over a prism this breaks down into its seven constituent colors and uh, where the blue color or the violet colored has maximum frequency and minimum wavelength and vice versa for red color right now how was raman effect discovered there is an uh, there is an interesting story for it once cv raman was traveling over mediterranean sea and here and there he was flying over there and he saw the sea and he was intrigued by the blue color of the sea and then he thought that what is the reason that the sea is uh, in deep blue in color but uh, before uh, before his discovery of raman effect there was some explanations that uh, see this blue color of the oceans is due to reflection of the sky but raman was not satisfied by this and so he did his research and he found out that this blue color of the sea is due to scattering of light by the water molecules and this water molecules they are scattering light and because of which it is imparting blue color now let's understand what is scattering of light so scattering of light in general can be of two types one is elastic scattering and other is inelastic scattering elastic scattering means that say this is a molecule this is any molecule say any air molecule water molecule or any solid molecule right and there is an incident light a light has been incident on it this is incident light and this molecule will scatter the light that is the light will change its direction when hitting this molecule right this is scattered light now in the case of elastic scattering if e1 is the energy of this light and in this e1 we can say that if v1 is its frequency lambda1 is its wavelength then the scattered light will also have same energy and it will it will also have same frequency and same wavelength in simple terms it means that in case of elastic scattering the energy of a incident light and scattered light is same right e1 equals to e1 e1 equals to e2 we can say so these energies are same in this uh, in this first case right so as we all know that the color of any light is associated with a particular wavelength so in this case if we saw that if the wavelength in first case in in the case of incident light and also in the case of scattered light is not changed is unchanged then the light will be of same color only right so this is known as elastic scattering or rayleigh scattering now what did raman discover now this was the case of inelastic scattering raman found out that there are certain molecules where if you incident a light on this molecule the scattered light will have different color this is because the energies of incident light and scattered light will be different this will mean that say in most of the cases e1 is greater than e2 right that is in the case of inelastic scattering the energy of incident light is will be more or less than the energy of scattered light these energies will not be same now because of these energies are changing it means that the wavelength and the frequency of this light will be changed this will mean that the light the color of this incident light and the color of this reflected light scattered light will be different they will not be of the same color so this observation is known as raman effect right so this is the observation let me sum it up again 
Raman effects means that when the energy of any incident light is different than the energy of any scattered light or any reflected light, then in that case we can see that this is Raman effect. Now Raman effect, why was it uh, helpful for us? This was helpful for us because it came uh, because by studying Raman effect in various molecules. Say there are different molecules like oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, various other molecules. If we see that how they are scattering light and based on it, if we plot the spectrum of these molecules or other organic molecules, we will find a definite spectrum for each particular molecule. That is, in simple terms, if we say their spectrum of oxygen will be different than the spectrum of hydrogen, it is akin or it is similar to different fingerprints. Like they will have different fingerprints and if we know the spectrum of any particular gas, any particular atom, right, or solid liquid or gas, any particular molecule, if we know its spectrum, we can identify the presence of that element from any given sample, right. So this became the basics of Raman spectroscopy. Now Raman spectroscopy has been employed in chemical analysis of various molecules. This has been employed in the medicine sector. For example, by observing the spectrum of a healthy cell and then, then observing the spectrum of any cancerous cell, we can identify that these particular tissues, because their spectrum is different, they are cancerous, right? So these are certain applications of Raman spectry, uh, of Raman spectroscopy. I hope you understood this article. Now let's move on to our uh, fourth article for the day, which is which says that the Genome India project has been completed. So the Department of Biotechnology has officially announced the completion of thousand genome of thousand of ten thousand of ten thousand genome project. So let's see what is this genome project. Now Genome India project, this is a project for whole genome sequencing. We will see this, what is genome sequencing? It is a project for genome sequencing and subsequent data analysis of 10,000 Indian individuals by the year 2023. So this project was launched by the Department of Biotechnology in January 2020. And now the Department of Biotechnology has said that this project has been completed as the genome of 10,000 Indian population, Indian individuals have been mapped, right? Their genomes have been sequenced. Now, let's understand that what do we mean by genome sequencing? So, what is a genome? Genome is a set of, entire set of DNA which is present in any individual. Now, if it's confusing for it, let's understand that, see, this is cell. What is cell? Cell is the basic unit of any life and you have all heard this in class 9th. And then cell contains a nucleus. This is nucleus, right? And what is inside nucleus? Nucleus, con ins nucleus contains DNA or our genetic information in a condensed form. In heavily coiled condensed form. And this condensed form of DNA or this, this is known as chromosome. Chromosome is nothing but a condensed form of DNA, right? These, uh, and now what is DNA? DNA codes for? DNA is a code for genetic information of any individual. This is the genetic code of an individual. And if we see the structure of DNA, remember this is the this is DNA. This is this has a double helical structure. And what does genome sequencing mean? Genome sequencing means that if we decode the entire DNA present in any individual. So this DNA has these nucleotide bases which are arranged as some particular order, we can say. Like, like AT, GC. So there is a subsequent order for it. If I say AA, these are random, random orders for it. So this is a particular sequence of DNA, right? And this is the coding for this sequence. Now in this mapping, in the genome sequencing project, if we find out that how these base pairs are arranged for the entire length of DNA present in any individual, that is the entire DNA which is present in the 23 pairs of chromosome. 
in any individual then we will say that if we know the order of these base pairs we will say that the genome has been mapped or been decoded right and a segment of this dna which codes for any particular protein is known as gene right so these are the basics of science and now what was the aim of this genome sequencing project this aim it, it aimed to create a comprehensive database of genetic variations in indian population as we all know that we all humans are different because of our difference in gna difference in the way our gna is coded difference in the way these nucleotide base pairs are arranged in our body so if we map out that what are the sections of this dna and we all know that these these particular sections of dna they encode for genes and these individual genes they can encode for any particular protein and by mapping out this gna we can find out which gene can code for which protein and if these genes if they have any abnormality if they have any mutation so if we know this mapping we can find out that we can find out we can map out the physical traits of any individual we can learn about the genetic variants which are unique to india and this will be helpful in disease mapping right for example you can say that in tribal areas if you have heard that there is a uh, enormous presence of sickle cell anemia right and particularly it infects sickle cell anemia particularly infects tribal population that is they have a certain kind of gene which is encoding for sickle cell anemia right so if we can map out this gene in any particular population we can silence this gene or we can do any kind of gene therapy right so we need uh, information for genetic mapping for and uh, for targeted drug therapy and for creating personalized medicine right and now this entire gene, uh, this entire data set of genes of 10000 individuals which have been mapped out this will be stored in indian biological data center which is the first of a kind data center in india which will be a repository of biological information in the country earlier india used to store its biological information or this data sets in the repositories of us or european union right so this is all about this uh, article and now let's see this article next article which says that four indian air force pilots named as possible gaganyaan crew now gaganyaan if you remember gaganyaan gaganyaan is a highly ambitious project of isro and gaganyaan is the first attempt of india to launch humans to space that is it's a it is a human spacecraft mission a spacecraft which aims to carry humans to space so where are these humans going to uh, station in this mission there will be uh, a launch there will be a stationing of a launch module of say launch capsule which will be stationed in the low earth orbit at around 400 kilometers and this is space capsule this is space capsule it has capacity of 3 people that is 3 astronauts can be stationed here and now uh, this news article says that these four officers of indian air force they have been chosen as potential as possible gaganyaan crew that out of these four people either two two of them or either three of them would be chosen as astronaut for gaganyaan mission now what is the present status of gaganyaan mission presently uh, various test various test have been done uh, to ensure that these people are stationed safely Uh, in this orbital mission in this orbital module and they return back to earth after spending a few days in space right and what is uh, one uh, one more thing you must know that this mission this rocket to the low earth orbit this is a spacecraft carrying these people will be launched by launch vehicle mark 3 or gslv mark 3 and which is a launch vehicle of isro the highly advanced launch vehicle of isro and which uses cryogenic fuel okay you must see these facts about this mission and uh, apart from this if i am not missing out on any information okay see this mission it is two uncrewed mission two uncrewed flights 
of this Gaganyaan module will be made in the low earth orbit and these are these two uncrewed flight before the final crewed flight. Crewed flight means a flight which is carrying these astronauts. Before this flight which is carrying these astronauts, there will be two, we can say demo flights, two uncrewed flights. In the year 2024, these are scheduled here and the final flight is expected to be conducted in the year 2025, right? And apart from this, this, this news article says that India aims to, uh, India aims to have its own space station by the year 2035, own, own space station and India aims to launch its astronauts to moon by the year 2040, right? Now let's move on to our prelims, uh, our uh, MCQs for prelims, right? So the first, uh, first MCQ is based on this news article which appeared on the page number 11 of business line. Now this news article is regarding green credit initiative by the government and which was launched uh, last year in the year 2023, October 2023. So what is this green credit uh, initiative? This is a kind of voluntary, say voluntary financial initiative which aims to improve the health of environment. That is, what is green credit basically? Green credit refers to a unit of incentive which will be provided to any person who has done a positive impact to environment. So if there is a person and there are certain categories of environmental impact, these categories are say any person, any individual, any community or any business house, right? If they aim to do voluntary environmental uh, well voluntary programs to serve or to benefit the environment there are certain categories for them they can participate in these uh, in these initiatives and for which they will be awarded green credit basically these they can engage in the activities like tree plantation water conservation sustainable agriculture waste management air pollution reduction mangrove conservation and restoration sustainable building infrastructure these are the initiatives in which any individual any community member or any business house can voluntarily engage and in lieu of their engagement in these environment friendly initiatives they will be given certain kind of green credits and what can they do with green credits with the help of these green credits any individual say ESG environment social governance leadership these credits this person can show can reflect as his contribution to environmental social and governance leadership or say there is any business house right any corporate institution has to do has some corporate social responsibility for which it has to mandately spend say around two percent of its profit in doing certain kind of corporate social responsibility certain kind of activities right so as part of CSR initiative by the corporation, they can engage in accumulating green credit by doing such kind of activities, right? And also in case of compulsory afforestation program, these are such program where say there is a business house, it wants, uh, wants to clear a patch of forest or a forest land, clear a patch of forest land, but, uh, but for it, it has to plant these clear trees in any other area, right? And this is known as compulsory afforestation. And such business house can avail green credits by doing afforestation, by doing tree plantation in government land also under this green credit initiative. And this can compensate for his compulsory afforestation program, right? And now for it, there have been certain rules as this scheme is a new a newly launched scheme in October 2023 and certain rules have been annotated, has been announced by the government under Environment Protection Act 1986 and let us see some of these rules. What are these uh, rules? First of all, this, uh, this article says that any individual business house or any person 
can do afforestation in any government land also and for that he has to register to a government portal and he has to uh, for that he has to register to a government portal and then government will allot him a particular piece of land government will allot him and he has to pay the administration charges and he has to pay the cost of plantation of trees in this land and once he pays this fees the forest officials the forest officials they will do tree plantation so what did we learn that there is a person who wants to do compulsory afforestation there is a person who wants to do afforestation who wants to participate in this program so he will have to register to a government portal on website government will allocate a particular area of land to this person and this person will have to pay administration charges and also the amount for uh, planting trees in this particular area of land and for the matter fact of the matter this allocated area of land this should be more than 5 hectares equal to 5 hectares or more than 5 hectares of land and then forest officials will do tree plantation on the behalf of that person that community or that business house and in return they will get green credit and this green credit can be traded also like a market mechanism it can be traded right so this is and this all process after the uh, submission of this fee this all process has to be completed within the period of in the period of two years only right so this is a broad overview of this rules which have been uh, notified by the government so based on this let's solve this practice question which we have formulated the practice question says that consider the following statements with reference to the green credit rules by the ministry of environment forest and climate change the first statement says under the rules only corporate entities can be assigned land parcels for tree plantations now this is an incorrect statement as not only corporate entities but any community and and even an individual also can be assigned land parcels for tree plantation so this is an incorrect statement the second statement says that the tree plantation process must be completed within a period of 3 years from the date of payment by the entity so this is also incorrect statement as this entire tree plantation process should be completed within a period of 2 years and one more thing for per for one tree planted one green credit will be given so one green credit per tree planted right now the third statement says the land parcel identified for tree plantation must have minimum size of 5 hectares and yeah this is a correct statement now as the question asked how many of the above statements given above is or are correct the correct answer would be option a only one now with this let's move on to our final article for the day and which is inspired by this news article and it uh, has it is basically it tells about the newly discovery a new discovery of a pathogen which has been termed as obelisk now obelisk is a new pathogen which has been found in the gut and in the oral cavity that is in the mouth of any organisms of humans so it is a pathogen which lives in gut and mouth of humans and obelisk this is a new pathogen which lies between virus and viroids now quickly let's understand what are virus and what are viroids now if you remember what are viruses viruses if you know that they are placed in a different category of pathogens they are different from bacteria because of their size also and because of their one important characteristic that they viruses are categorized in between living and non living entities that is a virus is dormant outside the cell of any organism but once a virus enters the cell of any organism the virus becomes active or alive why why so because any virus basically what is a virus virus we can this is a simplest uh, simplistic representation of a virus so this is virus with some genetic material this is a virus this is a genetic material inside virus 
and this genetic material can be either DNA or RNA. That is, virus in, virus is any pathogen which has a genetic material either DNA or RNA, and this genetic material is enclosed by this is enclosed by a capsid or a protective protein coating. We can say this capsid is a protein coating which protects this genetic material or DNA or RNA and viruses are dormant they are not alive outside uh, the cell of any organism but once these viruses they attach to the human cell say this is a human cell and this is virus which is attaching via receptors to this human cells then this virus will release this virus once it attaches to human cell it will release its genetic material DNA or RNA in case the virus uh, is a DNA virus and otherwise it will release RNA material inside the human cell. See this virus is entering human cell, it is releasing its genetic material and then what will happen? This virus will hijack our human cells or any organism cell to propagate the genetic material of that virus. Earlier, the cell was propagating its own genetic material, but now this virus has entered the cell and then now this cell is aiding, is propagating the genetic material of this virus and hence this will lead to development of or replication of new viruses or creation of new viruses, right? So, in summation, virus is hacking, hijacking the cell replication process of humans and uh, uh, the replication is hijacking the cell in this way they are replicating and now there is a other category which is viroid now how are viroid they were discovered lately in 1971 and how are viroids different from viruses the primary difference is that see in case of virus it had genetic material and a protective coating but viroids they are just genetic material that is there, there is a genetic material with no protective coating no coating and this genetic material in in the case of this viroid is only RNA. It does not have a DNA. And this, this is an oversimplification of a viroid. And this has shown that this viroid has a circular RNA. That is, this genetic material has been coiled and it is circular, right? So it is a viroid is a circular RNA and it has no outer protective coating and it primarily infects plants and it is uh, it causes various diseases in plants and till date research is being uh, undergoing that how it infects uh, can it infects humans but uh, such cases have not been found right now there is an other category of pathogen which has been recently discovered and this is in between viruses and viroids now this is this new category is known as obelisk and obelisk lies between virus and viroid. It is similar to viroid in the sense that it also has a circular RNA. It has a circular RNA. But one important difference between viroid and obelisk is that, see if I draw obelisk here, and this is vi viroid. This obelisk, this viroid, earlier this viroid, this RNA present in viroid has only around 200 to say 450 nucleotides. Nucleotides are base pairs. In any RNA, these are base pairs. So, a viroid has only 200 to 450 nucleotides, but an obelisk has more than 1000 nucleotides. So, this is the basic difference between viroid and uh, obelisk. And other thing is that viroid, they have an RNA, but they don't do protein coding. That is, these viroid, they, they use the enzymes of plants for their replication, but they don't do protein coding for their replication. But this uh, particular, this obelisk, it has certain proteins and uh, it has proteins, uh, it does protein coding. So 
तो दिस इज द इम्पॉर्टेंट डिफरेंस बिटवीन वायरसेस ओबेलिस्क एंड एंजाइम एंड वायरॉइड्स नाउ बेस्ड ऑन दिस इंफॉर्मेशन लेट अस सॉल्व दिस प्रैक्टिस क्वेश्चन विच सेज दैट कंसिडर द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट्स स्टेटमेंट वन द जेनेटिक मटेरियल ऑफ वायरसेस कन कंसिस्ट ऑफ बोथ आर एन एज वेल एज डी एन ए नाउ दिस इज अ करेक्ट स्टेटमेंट एज वायरसेस कैन बी आर एन ए वायरस एज वेल एज डी एन ए वायरस सेकेंड स्टेटमेंट द आर एन ए ऑफ वायरॉइड्स कोड फॉर स्पेसिफिक प्रोटीन्स यूज फॉर देअर रेप्लीकेशन नाउ दिस इज एन इनकरेक्ट स्टेटमेंट दिस इज बिकॉज वायरॉइड्स दे रेप्लीकेट बाई यूजिंग एनजाइम्स प्रजेंट इन प्लांट्स दीज एनजाइम्स आर प्रजेंट इन साइटो इन प्लास्टिक्स इन प्लांट्स एंड इन न्यूक्लियस ऑफ प्लांट्स सो यूजिंग दीज एनजाइम्स प्लान प्रजेंट इन प्लास्टिक्स ऑफ प्लांट्स एंड न्यूक्लियस ऑफ प्लांट्स दीज वायरॉइड्स रेप्लीकेट्स बट दे डू नॉट यूज प्रोटीन्स फॉर रेप्लीकेशन on the other hand which we already saw that obelix they use proteins for replication now obelix rna it is much longer than rna of viroids as we also saw this that this is correct and it codes for two proteins this is also a correct statement now as the statement asked how many of the above statements are correct our correct answer would be only two as two statements are correct now this was all for today's discussion If you have any queries you can ask us in the comment section thank you